Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a joy to be back at Resurrection Life, and I am blessed also that you guys, well, first of all, you have leadership that does not compromise about the Word of God. And they said, just go for it. So I am blessed with Pastor Dwayne and Jeannie. Great to be back. Um, and I will, right after this service, I'm going to go over to the book tables. I'll meet you. I'll sign every book I can. I'll just quickly tell you what they have. They're going to have most of my books since I've been here last. There's six more, um, including the Book of Mysteries, The Harbinger, The Return of the Gods, which we'll talk about this morning, The Josiah Manifesto, which I'm going to touch on tonight. Most are hardcovers, the, the newest list for about $30, but they're going to make it $16. If you get two, three, it's going to keep going down and down until everything's going to be $10. That's less than a Big Mac meal at McDonald's. So you can't save anybody with a Big Mac. So we praise that you give it to other people. Last quick thing is they're going to have special resources. You cannot, there's one special resource you cannot, that's not nowhere else, not Amazon. It's the return, it's actually the Josiah Manifesto, which just came out, the uncensored eight DVD album. You'll reveal, it'll show you prophetic things and it's uh, more than, it's nowhere else on earth. So that's special. I only do it where I'm speaking. And that's it. Tonight, I'm going to not only speak about uh, the mysteries in the Josiah Manifesto, but also reveal something I have never revealed outside of my congregation, how one of the mysteries in the book actually foretold what is happening in Israel right now and down to the exact date. And it's a very gigantic thing. So that's tonight. I invite people out and let's, are we ready? All right. What I'm going to open up today is the mystery that lies behind everything that is taking place in America, Western civilization, people around you, the transformation of our culture. In many ways, it's going to explain many things that you're dealing with because you're all dealing with it. And is it possible that what the Bible speaks about as the gods, the false gods, are not just mythology, but that there's something behind them? And what if these spirits, these things, are in the world today? What if we're dealing with them? What if they lie behind the changes in our culture? What's happening to our children? What's happening to our families? And is there hope? And what is God saying? That is why I wrote The Return of the Gods. And that is what, and Pastor Duane wanted me to share, very importantly, this, because it's for now. And it's not only going to reveal, but it's to arm you and strengthen you and empower you. And this is because it affects every one of you. If you're in a fight and you don't know what you're fighting, your chances are you're not going to win. Or if you don't know the power you have. Now, if you came here this morning to hear a politically correct message, you came to the wrong place, the wrong service, and the wrong speaker. I'm not here to share political correctness. I'm here to share truth. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter in the end. What were the gods? In ancient times, the world was filled with the gods. Every nation, every culture. Every land worshipped the gods. And the Bible gives us the first clue to this mystery that many believers miss. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says that those who worship the gods worship something called the Shedim in Hebrew. Shedim is the Hebrew word. It doesn't mean mythology. It means spirits, entities, with consciousness, with will. In the Psalms, it says the people sacrificed their children to the Shedim. Now, when the ancient Jewish scribes translated that word into Greek, it went into the New Testament as the word daimonia. We get the word demon or demonic from it. Paul in 1 Corinthians says that the pagans are worshiping gods and idols. They're actually worshiping the daimonia, the shedim, the spirit. So beyond the gods were entities, dark entities. So the myths of man follow this, they, the, the entities play on it. Now the next piece of this mystery. If the gods represented spirits and the pagan world was given to the gods, then they were given to the spirits. They were indwelt by them. Pagan culture has all the signs of a possessed culture. It's amazing when you look at pagan culture in ancient times, you look at the, the, the high priests, the oracles, the worshipers, all had the signs of demonic possession. And so this was all over the world. So what happened? What happened to the gods? What happened to all this? Jesus happened. Messiah happened. God came into the world. He sent his word into the world. The land of the gods. Now you have the power of God. And there came a clash of civilization. And that's why Christians were thrown to the lions, ultimately because it was a spiritual war. It was ultimately a war, but in the end, the gospel of Messiah prevailed, triumphed. The temples of Zeus became empty. The shrines of Dionysus were abandoned. 
It was the twilight of the gods. The gods were gone, but if behind the gods were spirits, then it wasn't just the departure of the gods, it was the greatest mass exorcism in human history. And that's why Western civilization has been so unique because it was the one civilization that was exorcised. But spirits don't die. So what happened to them? Now the final clue to unlock this mystery comes from the parable given by Messiah. He said, if a spirit comes out of a man, it goes wandering the earth looking for a place to dwell, finds none, says, I will return to the house from which I came. So it goes back to the man and finds, it says, it finds the house swept, clean, empty. Then it says, I'm going to go back and takes seven other spirits and they come back to the house or the man and repossess him. And then now the repossession is eight times worse. So Messiah says that the latter state is worse than the first state. And now we hear this and we think it's talking about a man. Well, it is, but it's more than that. Because at the end of the parable, the Lord says, so it will be with this generation. This generation, not just individuals, but entire cultures can be oppressed, can be possessed, can be under the influence, can be delivered, and can be repossessed. And now taking what he said to its most global application, we have a warning to the modern world, to the West, and to America. And the warning is this. Any culture, any nation, any civilization that has known God, that's been delivered by God, cleansed by God of these things, if it should ever turn away from God, if it should ever empty itself of the spirit, of the gospel, of the power, of the faith that cleansed it, then those spirits that were cast out of it will come back into it. The same ancient spirits, the same ancient Quote, gods will return. The Shadim, the Daimonia, will come back to the house to inhabit it, to repossess it. Pagan gods will come back to a house that's been cleansed, a Judeo-Christian civilization. And they will seek to turn that culture into a pagan one. They will begin a process of paganization. And we will watch, we want to understand what's been happening to America in the last half century or so. The increasingly dark, bizarre, irrational changes that are happening in our culture. This is what's happening. We are witnessing a repossession. And remember what the Lord said, the last state will be worse than the first state. So it means if America ever turns away from God, the last state will be worse than it was in pagan culture. You see, pagan culture could produce a Nero, but a post-Christian culture produces a Hitler or an Antichrist. Now, which gods, which principalities will lead in this return. When Israel turned away from God, it turned to other gods, became subject to them. There were three in particular in the return of the gods. I call them the dark trinity. The same dark trinity of gods are what we are witnessing or spirits in our midst. The first was called the possessor. That's what his name meant in Hebrew. Possessor, the master, the Lord, the owner. In Hebrew, he was called Baal. We call him Baal. In ancient times, it was this spirit that came into the land of Israel. When Baal comes to America, this is what, this spirit is the spirit that turns a nation that once knew God into a basically pagan nation. How would it happen? We would have to have opened the door. We'd have to begin emptying ourselves of God, and that's exactly what happened. When you look at the early 60s, America... And the West begins emptying itself of God, removes prayer from the school, then, fr from the, then the Bible, from the children, thought it was no big deal. No, it was a real big deal. Because when you take God from the children, you're taking God from the future. And the, the warning of Messiah, of Jesus, is that the house will not stay empty. If you take God out of the schools, something else will come into the schools. You take God from the children, something else will come into the children. And that's all that was needed for this spirit of the possessor. What did he do? What did this spirit do in ancient times? He drove God out of Israel's culture, out of the, out of the public square, out of the marketplace. Well, that's exactly what's been happening to America. In ancient times, the spirit of Baal caused Israel to turn away from the commandments of God, overturn them. Well, that's exactly what has happened to America, overturning God's ways one after the other. The Bible says Baal caused Israel to forget God. So the spirit of Baal returned has caused America to forget God. 
to forget that it ever knew God. Think of the America that was before the 1960s, where the nation's, the nation's teachers led the children in the Lord's Prayer all across America. That, that America we can barely remember. And that America could not have imagined this America. What has happened? It is a phenomenon of paganization. What came in as a new morality was actually a pagan morality. The spirit of this possessor is actually behind all sorts of things that we don't even think about. It's behind wokeism. You see, when there's one God, there's one truth. But in paganism, there are many gods, so there are many truths. That's why our culture has been taken over by this spirit that says there's no real truth. Everybody has their own authentic truth. If a man says he's not a man, he's a cat, well, then that's his authentic truth. There's one sign of Baal above all others in ancient times. You know what it was? It was a sign of a bull, a, specifically a molten bronze bull. Could that sign appear in America? Well, it already has. Go come to New York City, not far from ground zero where the harbingers are. You'll see an image, a massive bronze molten bull, the ancient sign in the Bible of the possessor or of a nation that once knew God and turned away. They had no idea, but they did it. Now, there was another sign of Baal that actually manifested in New York City where they actually erected it. I was there to, to film it, to witness it, where they actually erected an, an object of Baal and it, and it had a ceremony around it. But this is a real thing. Now, when you look back at the Bible, you see that, the, that Baal is always mentioned first among the gods. And then the next thing, there's another one that's often number two, and that is a she. And that is the next of the dark trinity. It's a goddess. And she was called, in the book, she's called the Enchantress. It says Baal and this one, Ashtorah in the Bible. Ashtorah. Now Ashtorah was the wife or the consort of Baal. But she appears all over. In Babylon, she was called Ishtar. In Sumer, Inanna. In Phoenicia, she was called Astarte. In Greece, she was called Aphrodite. She's the goddess of unbridled sexuality. She was a prostitute, a harlot goddess. In ancient times, she sexualized pagan culture. And, and the, so the Bible says, Baal and then Ashtorah. So the same thing happened in the return. First, we began turning away from God, and then what happened? What would we expect to happen? We'd expect the realm of sexuality to be overturned. That's exactly what happened. Right after we begin turning from God, we have the sexual revolution which is the transformation of sexuality from a Judeo-Christian groundwork to a pagan one. It's the work of this principality. And that is to overturn a nation, paganize it through the realm of sexuality, of marriage, of ultimately gender. A prostitute takes sexuality out of marriage. and brings it into the culture. In ancient times, that's what she did. It was all in the temple. Sexuality was everywhere. So what happens to America? Sexuality was taken out of marriage, put into the culture, put into the marketplace. She sexualized our culture. She's sexualizing our children. And that's it's happening to this day. And when she, a prostitute also weakens marriage. So that's exactly what we, we've seen at the same time. It's no accident because we've watched the weakening of marriage, the weakening of family, the breaking of marriage in America. In ancient times, in Greek, she was called the sacred prostitute. From, and, and, but in Greek, the word for her, for prostitute, was the word porne, from which we get the word porn or pornography. No accident. The first pornography in the world was the literature of this goddess. She was the inventor of it. And, and she, so this is one who seduces a culture. Now, there's so much more to it we can't get into in the time we have, but just to mention it's no accident she was also the goddess of the occult or casting spells. At the same time, in the 60s, you have the sexual revolution. You have a revival of the occult. To the, part, to the point right now, in America, there are more witches in America than there are Presbyterians. The revival. She is also linked to drugs and linked to, linked to intoxication. We won't go into it. We've got to move on to the next of the dark trinity. This one in the book is called The Destroyer. This is the principality that causes parents to offer up their own children as sacrifices. The pagan world was filled with human sacrifice, child sacrifice. If you were a child in pagan times, it was not safe to be a child. They would be, 
they would be abused, they would be sexualized, they would be enslaved, and they would be offered up. When Israel turned away from God, they begin offering up their own children. And the only thing that ended child sacrifice in the world, you know what it was? It was the gospel. It was the name of Jesus. That tells you how right your faith is. But the ancient warning is, if a nation ever turns away from God, the spirits will come back. And so the destroyer, known in Hebrew as Molech, he returns and comes into our culture, comes to America, like clockwork. First the possessor, the turning away. Number, secondly, the, the, the enchantress sexual revolution. Third, it leads to the destroyer. At the end of the, of the 1960s, America begins offering up its own children. This is the most pagan of acts. It's the crown of paganization. Israel offered up thousands of its children to the gods. America has offered up millions of its children. We won't go into it, but in the book, I looked at the ancient elements of child sacrifice, the rituals, and you can see them manifest in abortion today. I'll mention one, just one thing. It was the children of the poor, more than any other, that were lifted up to this God. And that's why today it's the children of the poor that, is, that are lifted up and killed in their mother's womb more than any other. And this is the sin that brought judgment and destruction to Israel. What will it do to America? But now we have to go deeper. As I looked at the inscriptions from Mesopotamia, Concerning this goddess, the goddess, the enchantress, I found something strange. She says, I am a woman, and then she says, I am a man. One of her hymns praises her, saying, you are the one who turns a man into a woman and turns a woman into a man. You want to understand what's really happening in our culture? It goes back to this. This is her deeper work. She doesn't do it at the beginning because it's too radical to have done it decades, but as the culture gets possessed, as she becomes entre entrenched in the culture, this is the deeper work that begins manifesting, and so it has. This is a spirit that confuses gender, that, that, re that replaces gender, merges, blends male and female, boy and girl, is going to enter the culture, and so it has. One of the ancient inscriptions of this goddess says, she grinds away the masculinity of men. So a spirit has entered our culture, we all know this spirit, that, that seeks to emasculate men, rages against them as did the goddess, remove them from their calling as fathers, as husbands, as protectors, as manhood, and seeks to emasculate them or feminize them. At the same time, the goddess, it says, turns women into men. So we have a spirit in our culture that is seeking to transform women, defeminize women, masculinize women, take them away from womanhood, take them away from marriage, take them away from life, from motherhood. See, the goddess was female, but with masculine characteristics. So she seeks, she seeks to make women in her image and ultimately destroy women. That's why there's even a movement now to remove the word woman. But her power, her power actually went deeper. The goddess had a mysterious priesthood. They were men who walked around her temples, filled her temples, who dressed in women's clothing. Parents would take their children to see these men in women's clothing perform. If you see that happening again in your culture, know it's a sign that, this is, that something very dark is possessing the culture. And remember what Messiah said. When the spirits come back, they come back worse. In ancient times, she possessed her priesthood. But now she is seeking to possess an entire generation of children. The gods are always after the children. Because if you can get the children, you can possess the nation, and you can possess the future of that nation. It began by taking prayer out of school, separating children from God, but you take God out, something else will come in, and look what has now come into the schools. Look what has now come into the children. It is not an accident, but it goes even further. The goddess seeks men to become as women in the realm of sexuality, but also she, it says she turns a man into a woman, a woman into a man. One of the things the goddess or the spirit did to the priesthood is she would have them, listen, surgically transitioned, even from men to women. I've even found an ancient inscription from 
Mesopotamia that says that speaks about the transition men dancing before the goddess, holding scalpels up as if to celebrate their transition. And now adults are doing this to children. And even, even liberals, people are saying, what on earth would possess an adult to do that to a child? Well, this would possess them. Now, there was one event that began the entire movement that has altered sexuality and gender in America. It happened at the end of the 1960s with an uprising in New York City called, concerning a same-sex bar called Stonewall. From that has come the entire movement called Pride, the altering of sexuality, the altering of marriage. On the night that the riots began, the ancient mystery manifested. Now, we don't have time to go into it, but, but I put this in the book, and that is except to say this. The signs of the goddess actually manifested on the streets of New York City. It included even the, something called the Dance of Ishtar that was done on the streets of New York, linked to the goddess. Even the timing of when it happened was all, even the name Stonewall is in the mythology of the goddess. But the work of this principality has been taking over the culture. Let me show you some of the things. And once you see it, you're not going to unsee it. Let me, some of the mysteries here. And the ancient inscriptions reveal that the goddess oversaw ancient pagan parades, that she made people parade before her, it says. Each year, she, the goddess or the spirit would cause men to parade through the city streets as women, women parading as men, in, in parades of great color and the bending of gender and sexual licentiousness. Well, they're back. They're back. In the ancient world and the ancient calendar, the goddess had, there was one month that was claimed by the goddess to actually possess the culture. Her spirit would, would, would be in the rituals, would be in the, in the parades. What month was it? I looked back at the writings of the first Christians. Saint Jerome identified it. He calls it the month in Latin of Iunium, or we know it translates the month of June. June would become the month of this. See, when you turn away from God, everything goes back. And the spirits go back to the house they once had. So now June had been the month, and now, they, now June has become possessed as this month. You know, the goddess was the goddess of pride. And so we have an entire month called pride. And so the spirit returns to the house. And by the way, I want to tell you, such were some of you. Wherever you're from, God loves all of you equally. But we have to also stand at the same time. The goddess was linked to a sign. Do you know what the sign was? It was the sign of the rainbow. The mystery of the rainbow. Why is the rainbow taking over our culture, really replacing the cross? It's the mystery why. In her mythology, she was known. You see, the rainbow doesn't belong to the goddess. It doesn't belong to man. It doesn't belong to a moon. The rainbow belongs to God. But in her, in her mythology, she was known as the one who steals what belongs to other gods and use it for herself. And so the people who use it, they have no idea. But if they realize what this was, because and, and there's a mystery to every color of what that sign that they use, they would have second thoughts. It's a link to possession. Could the mystery even lie behind the Supreme Court? Well, the time that the goddess especially claimed, I said was June, but also was particularly the end of June, the time of the summer solstice. Now, there were three Supreme Court decisions that altered sexuality and marriage as we know it. I won't go into detail, except to say that every one of them took place in June. Every one of them took place at the end of June. Every one of them took place by the summer solstice. Every one of them took place by the days of the goddess. Every one of them took place on the exact same day, but 12 years apart. And on one of those days, marriage as we have known it was struck down and altered. And that night, when the White House was lit up with the colors of the rainbow, a sign from the goddess that she possess, she's possessing a nation, that night on the ancient calendar was the 10th of Tammuz. That was the day that it was legalized a man to marry a man, or a woman a woman. On the ancient Babylonian calendar, which is also the Bible's calendar, but the Babylonian writings, what I found, it was that day was actually ordained to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. That was the day that the Supreme Court did it. What is the agenda? What is the end game here? 
They have come back. These spirits have come back with a vengeance. You see, they were cast out of the ancient world by the word of God. So they are trying to cast out the word of God from our culture. They were encroached by the gospel. Their worship ended because of the gospel. So they have a target set on believers. That's why there's a rising hostility to God in this country and to believers, to you, toward the gospel and religious freedom. Their temples and shrines were closed down by, the, by ultimately the power of God, so they're seeking to encroach on houses of God. As they were once cast out in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, they are now seeking to cast his name totally out of culture. And they were driven to the margins by believers. They are seeking to, uh, to target you, a believer. When these spirits first come in, they do so step by step. In the name of tolerance, that's how they came in. But once they get in, and once they get established and empowered, everything changes. Then the gods move, or the spirits move, to cancel every voice of opposition from a culture of toleration and, a, and to a culture of cancellation. They, they move to that every knee shall bow to them, every tongue shall confess, they would seek to force everyone to go along to celebrate them, and anyone in opposition, whether that be a believer or someone who's conservative or traditional, they will seek to silence that voice. Anyone who stands in their way, they will seek to cancel. The age began with the war of the gods, the first Christians and the Roman Empire. Well, that war is back. And this goes right into end time prophecy. What does it say of the last days? What does it say? It says it'll be a time of deceiving spirits where men become lovers of self. Immorality increases. People will be without natural affection and they will persecute the people of God. Well, this is the mystery behind all that that we're dealing with. And by the way, the Word of God also says that in the last days, the nation of Israel will be back in the world and the world will focus on it. You can know with all that's happening, pray, but know that your God is real. Your God is here. The Word is true. All this, I mean, the Bible said in the last days you'll have Israel, you'll have this controversy. It also says there'll be a great falling away and we're all there. The Bible, so be encouraged because what the Bible said is coming true. This is the mystery behind how we, we are able to just, I'm able to just touch on some of the mysteries here to give you a taste of this this morning. But first thing, how do we, we take this home? First, it has everything to do with you. Because everyone here, every issue is affecting you or people in your life. Some of these things are hitting even closer to some of you. What do you do? Remember Gideon. He had a stand against the gods. In order to do the great and mighty things that he was called to do, he had to first do something. He had, it turns out there was an altar of Baal in his backyard. He had to go there and break that altar of Baal. Then God used him mightily, so for you. If you're going to stand in these days, and we're going to talk more about standing in the end times tonight, but if you're going to stand and prevail in this hour, you have to do the same thing. If there's anything in your life, any stronghold of, the, of these things, anything, whether it's an idol, whether it's a, the, the idol of money, whether it's pornography, whether it's a habit, indulgence, whatever stronghold, that's an altar, you have to break it. You, we need to, re, if you want revival, you got to repent. Break it off once and for all, and God will use you mightily. We're all dealing with this, what's happening in the culture. Believers have been under this barrage for years. And on the defensive, afraid to stand, afraid to compromise, the, or actually compromising their stand, but afraid of it. Even pastors across this land are becoming silent. Not here, but across this land. Listen, we are not the first to deal with this. In fact, for most of human history and most of Bible history, the gods and the spirits have been the rule. This has been the exception. But now it's back. The people of God are called to stand strong against the gods of their age. Moses stood against the gods of Egypt. Elijah stood against Baal and the gods of Canaan. Daniel stood against the gods of Babylon. Jeremiah stood against the god Molech. The Maccabees stood against Zeus and Paul and the first Christians stood against the gods of Rome. Now it's our turn. Now it's your turn. If you're born again, you got to stand as they stood. If you're Because you are born again, you are a child of Israel, is what the Bible says. And it's your heritage to stand against the gods and idols and sacred cows of this age. And if the dark is getting darker, 
then it's time for you, the lights of God, to shine even brighter. Yes. You see, these are the days when the grays are disappearing. And if the dark is removing the gray to become even darker, it's time for you, the light, to remove any gray from your life to become even brighter. You see, in the book of Acts, in the t days of the Bible, they didn't have a Christian culture. They had an anti-Christian culture. Well, that is where we are now. In the days of great evil, they are the days that will manifest great good for the one who will stand. When evil goes from bad to worse, it is time for the good to go from good to great. These are the days that produce greatness. The light that shines in the darkness is the light that lights up the world. You know, before we said we had a Christian culture, well, yeah, the light, it's like a light in the daytime, but now you're the light in the dark, but that is the light that will light up the night. Do not fear the end times, people. God called you in existence for such a time as this. If he called, you know, if he didn't want you here in the end times, he would have put you in the Middle Ages, but he didn't. He put you here. If he puts you, then he has appointed you. He will anoint you. He will empower you to do what you're called to do. Some of you have prayed. I wish, I wish I could live in Bible times. Congratulations. You're here. Welcome to Bible times. This is round two. You know, one of the mysteries I was going to share, but one of the mysteries, you know, is that everything in the end is going to return to where it was at the beginning. And so we mentioned, in the beginning of the age with Messiah, you had, you had an Israel in the world, you got an Israel back. You had Jewish people in Jerusalem, you got that back. You had a world culture that was anti-Christian and pagan, well, it's coming back. But it, and the Bible says it. But if everything's going back to where it was in the beginning, it's time for we, you, the church, the people of God, to go back to where we were in the beginning, which is the book of Acts and the power of God. You see, they dealt with all of it, and yet they, they overcame all of it. You know, we have to stand and live as one who's in the book of Acts because you have something more powerful than all the spirits of the gods. You have the spirit of the living God. And if you'll live by that spirit, you'll overcome any other spirit in this world. Live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, rise by the Spirit, overcome by the Spirit, fight by the Spirit, and you will win. When Israel crossed the Red Sea and the gods of Egypt were judged, Moses sang a song. He said, Micha mocha be'elim Adonai, who is like you, Lord, among the gods. There is no one like you, it said. There's no God. And the thing is, there's no God like our God. Our God is God and stronger than all the gods of the earth. And the name of Yeshua, Jesus, is stronger than the gods. By that name, the gods of the ancient world were cast out. The gods of an entire civilization by the name of Yeshua, Jesus, and you have that name. And that name is in you. There's no God like our God, there's no king like our king, and there is no savior like our savior, Jesus. And you've got the honor of standing for him. You know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean a lot when everybody says they gives lip service to Jesus, but when the world does not, now it means a lot. When you stand for him, when it's hard to stand for him, that is glorious. It says the spirit of glory is on you. Your God is so much stronger that you, all of us, everyone, have to not be, stop being intimidated by the darkness of our culture. And stop, when the world tells you to shut up, you gotta stand, you gotta shout louder. This is our day, this is our time. We wanted it, you know, I wish I could show it. Well, you've got the chance now. You've got the power, the name of Messiah, Jesus, not only casts out gods in the world, it, it casts out any spirit in your life, you've got the power over that darkness. Use the power. And if these are the days of Baal and Ashtorah and Moloch, then these must surely be the days of Elijah. If the gods have returned, it's time for the Elijahs of God to return. It's time for you and me to become the Elijahs of our day. You know, I don't know if you sing, you know, these are the days of Elijah. Well, let's become the Elijahs of the day. It's time to take our stand and be bold and courageous and confident in power against all the darkness of the earth. That's why we have the honor of living to be able to do that. It's time also to take your stand against that God, that spirit, that sin in your life. 
that's tried to intimidate you or that spirit that's tried to harass you, discourage you, defile you, seduce you, compromise you, make you bow down to it. It's time to stand against that darkness, that habit, that thing, that spirit, that fear, whatever, and say, no, no more. I will not bow down my knee to you again. I will not bow down to your bondage, to your temptation. I will not bow down to you. I will only bow down my knee to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the name of Yeshua, Jesus. You have no authority, for greater is he in me than you are in the land. Get off of my land. Get out of my nation. Get out of my house. Get out of my life. Get your hell out of my life, for greater is the God of my salvation. Thus says the Lord your God, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In the name above every name that is named, the name of Jesus, Yeshua, the anointed, the king above all kings, the Lord above all lords, and the God above all gods. Amen.